much for inviting me to speak. I'm Judith Winters, editor of Internet Archaeology. Um, today I'm going to talk very briefly about the journal and its contents, but it's going to specifically look at are the approaches that we've taken to publishing, specifically publishing data, but also look at the relationship that the, um, that the journal has with the archaeology data service. Um, and then I'll just conclude with some preservation and publication thoughts. I thought we'd first do a quick um, sort of time travel back into the web of 1996. So internet archaeology has been around since before Google, so that may be yet another new date that uh, we'll, we will incorporate into our uh, archaeological sort of uh, <laughs> corpora. Um, uh, this is how we used to search the web. Um, it was also a point at which we thought we could catalogue everything that was on the web, um, uh, but we know more now. But uh, yes, this does date me somewhat, so these are my own personal screen grabs from a long time ago. Um, the web was also a pretty colourless place, and you would spend an, an awful long time waiting for things to download. And, uh, and uh, yes, we, things have changed and moved on a little bit. This is what the journal looked like in 1996. Um, what I wanted to say really about this slide is that uh, things have changed, the journal doesn't look like that anymore, but uh, what we undertake to do is to uh, preserve and maintain the, the content of the journal. The interface uh, is something that we, we we're mindful of, but it's not something that we're actively uh, preserving. The ATS, late in 1996, actually looked like, like that. Although I think that logo was actually a later University of York logo, so even then it shows that the Wayback Machine, which is where the screen grabs came from, um, uh, doesn't preserve everything exactly as it looked uh, at that point in time. So this is what the journal looks like now. Um, the Internet Archaeology is, yes, has been publishing online since 1996. I've been editor for 19 of those years. So I've been a, I've, I'm prehistoric uh, in, in these things. Um, the journal is now an open access journal, uh, and uh, we work very closely uh, with the Archaeology Data Service, with whom, in fact, we share, um, we share a server and infrastructure. Uh, and actually, just, just, to, just to really dwell on that a little bit more, that, that that relationship with the ADS has been really mutually beneficial. In actual fact, the historic foundations go right the way back to the start. The journal existed before the ADS existed, and it was the realization that that data that was being published only in a digital form needed to have some sort of archive um, uh, and preservation uh, associated with it. So the ADS, in fact, initially piggybacked on the journal servers uh, when it was first set up um, later on. I mean, within 12 or 18 months of each other. Um, but now the relationship really does uh, 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 form around the fact that the ADS um, digitally preserves all of the journal content. But of course there have been archival efficiencies because we're also there sharing infrastructure, sharing an admin, uh, sharing a director um, uh, and such like. The, I suppose I just wanted to say something really quickly about the archiving work. This is sort of the hidden work that, that goes that goes on, um, and a lot of this is uh, is the metadata, and I suppose it's something that Gareth was talking about earlier on as well. It sort of resonated with me that that metadata is the stuff that that I add to whatever is published or deposited uh, uh, into inter internet archaeology. Those things are never usually complete, so that is something that I definitely add in that sort of at that archival stage. I should say that I, although I am editor of the journal, I am involved in the process right the way through from submission through to development through to um, refereeing publication and then through to um, initiating the archive but then thankfully I let the ADS take over um, at some point. <laughs> um, but yeah there's a lot of hidden work in that in that cataloguing and cleaning data and what have you that also goes on. Um, but the other the other element of that relationship are, are is, is are the things that actually have affected what we've what we've ever been able to publish, and certainly developing an approach that we've called an integrated publication, where we're actually using both the archive and the journal, uh, 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 in, as the journal publication, as a, as a way to best publish um, archaeological data. So that's something that I will look at in a little bit more detail uh, in in a moment. I'll just quickly run through the kind of content that the journal has published. Hopefully, most people in this room will have come across and heard of Internet Archaeology before today. Um, we publish a wide range of content. There's no geographical or chronological restrictions. 
there'll be elements in a lot of content that is going to be familiar from print, but we try to do what can't be done in print, so we definitely don't publish uh, PDFs. Um, I think Doug Rocks McQueen at a recent conference said, we take everything that's great about the web and we kill it with PDFs. Um, and he was excluding internet archaeology and, uh, from, from that. But, uh, but yeah, that's something that we, definitely don't, that we definitely don't do because we're talking and dealing with things that are much more than what just can be printed out on a, on a page. As we're talking about, in this case, review articles, uh, thematic issues often arising from conferences, um, but also then that richer visual material uh, like, like video. <laughs> and also, in fact, there's no size restriction on the content that the journal can publish. Uh, and this um, monograph, in fact, was probably something like 600,000 words long. Um, and I did read every single word. Uh, it took a long time, but, but just the point I wanted to make was that we work with both that long and those that short and that long form uh, publication. And also that we coordinate with print publications as well. And in, in this case, there was a print synthesis, which, which made up volume one of this example. <coughs> but it means that we can include a lot of data, whether that's images, and in fact, in this case, also able to drill down uh, into the underlying data archive that was also, uh, that was also disseminated at the same time. Um, the other thing that I think is so great about the journal, we don't work to any particular format or template, and the reason for this is that we can be, this is the royal way, I keep saying we, but <laughs> um, it's, it's being able to adapt to new technologies as they come along. So in this instance, I mean, five years ago, I hadn't heard of, um, um, of PTI. Uh, and so, but now we're able to embed with a, with a viewer that's been developed, we're able to bed, embed um, these RTI files within the journal article. This is where you can draw a light source over, in this case, some rock art, and, uh, and to be able to highlight and zoom in onto the detail. <clears throat> so that, I think, is a real strength and a flexibility about the journal, is that we can be adaptive to new technologies and new types of data as they, as they come along. Um, in the same sense, there are, we can also include things like virtual worlds. Uh, in this case, this was actually a 3D model from, uh, that was created in Unity, which is a gaming engine. Um, uh, and this is a, a, another one. Um, but I mean, not all Unity engines aren't the same. There's a bit of smoke and mirrors going on in the first one. And the second one was actually created out of laser scanning. So you can see that um, there are some preservation challenges um, in terms of this kind of data that is, is published uh, within, within the journal. But I think it's also important that we know, and so that's where the metadata comes in, it's important that we know how a lot of these models are created, so therefore we can best um, uh, preserve them. But the data, it's, it's safe, but it's fair to say that maybe in 20 years' time, this Unity, this particular Unity model, won't be something that maybe necessarily works, but there will be something else in its place. And that is what, where the journal is concerned there, about maintaining, um, maintaining access to that underlying uh, data. Uh, also, in the journal, we publish a lot of spatial data. Um, again, I suppose it's a, a preservation issue. In, in, in this case, uh, when it was first published, we were using um, uh, uh, what were we using? Esri, an Esri licensed um, uh, uh, GIS. What's it called? Thank you very much. Um, uh, but uh, well, licenses run out often, we made the decision to switch to open layers. So this is exactly the same map, the same data, but the interface obviously has changed um, since it was initially published. Um, so I suppose the, the point here is that there's a lot of active editing and active maintaining of a lot of the content that we've already published. And of course, as the journal continues to publish, that backlog of data that you need to create and curate and look after and maintain um, is, also, is also getting bigger. It's just another example of our open layers. Uh, in the 3D, in terms of 3D data, we are, I suppose, again, it's just something to highlight the preservation challenges of the content. Um, we are we included a RTI, the RTI viewer, but also a 3D viewer, which again was a viewer that we have, that we've shared that the ADS um, was uh, uh, involved in developing 
and it's something that the Journal N can benefit from uh, uh, as well within our publications. Um, and in this particular case, it was, there was also the chance to include uh, something that we didn't really think could be possible 10 years ago, which was um, a 3D printable model. So now um, I know that there are several actual physical um, 3D printed out uh, models of the, the star car pendant uh, floating around. So it's been quite an interesting case study as well in how the data has been used and reused. Um, I've pulled this slide up really just to then sort of highlight another approach really to data that I think is pretty unique to the journal. This is a, a, an article looking at Roman figure, figurines um, in Roman Britain. Uh, you can see here there's a, a, a clickable link. When you click on the link you actually can go through into the, the, the underlying data set which in this case isn't isn't disseminated via ADS, it's still within the journal. But uh, what I wanted to point out was the, um, the sort of serendipitous ability to link uh, the author just happened to include um, the Portable Antiquity Scheme number in the database and it meant that, that we could also uh, link through uh, to that as well. And I should say that I think that they... Um, uh, actually, no, I'll not say anything more about that. <laughs> um, the, so the thing that I mentioned earlier about integrated publication, uh, which is something that Peter asked me specifically to talk about today, uh, are, are exemplars that have come out of the LEAP project. Now, LEAP stands for Linking Electronic Archives and Publications. So it's really just an approach that we've taken from the very earliest days where, in this case, it's essentially an excavation report of a, a part of the, the Roman uh, town at Silchester. Um, you can see here there are some uh, context numbers. And what we were able to do was to link through from this, if you like, from the narrative, from the story of the site, straight through into the raw data uh, that also that is housed by the ADS, uh, and then, in fact, from there, users are able to drill back up again, either back into the archive or back up into the publication. Um, so I think it's an approach that's still pretty unique, uh, that and that's something that we're that we have uh, developed, and I think the ADS certainly uh, would would say that this kind of approach has enhanced the access to those particular uh, uh, archives uh, as well, that those archives get much greater use because they are less hidden. They're often mentioned in, if we think about the, what a printed publication might look like, you might say that the raw data is housed in you know, X, Y, Z. But in this way, that data is surfaced, it's made more visible. Um, the other thing that um, I really wanted to uh, discuss was our was a slightly different take on uh, data publication, uh, and that is the concept of a, of a data paper. So a data, a data paper is a short journal publication that's used to signpost a data set uh, in the digital archive, and to, but to give indication of that data's potential for reuse. Now, when I say short, I do mean something like about 1,000, 1,500 uh, words. Um, it's really just sort of an extended description of what's actually already in the archive. Because the difficulty at the minute is that we are given academic credit for publishing in journals, but we're not given the academic credit to <coughs> publish or disseminate a well-curated, well-documented digital archive. And so the, I suppose it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, hopefully it's just a stepping stone that that situation will change. But at the minute, this is at least one way of giving authors that, that credit that, 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 that they've done a good thing, that they've deposited their um, data in an archive. And it also indicates, as you can see, where the archive is actually available. The one thing that we've taken a little bit further, oh, well, here we go, that's the link through to the ADS archive. So it's no, in some ways it's not hugely different to the other approaches that we've taken where we're linking a publication and linking through to an archive. Um, but in, in, this, in this case, it's surfacing, the, it's focusing on the data specifically. Um, and, but what we've added is a referee statement, which, or we've asked someone to comment on the data set, which then pinpoints potential areas of reuse of that data set, um, which I think is something that, although we would like to see more of, and we often talk about reuse, but it's, it's, it's something that probably isn't happening as much as yet as, 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 as we would like. So the, the, data, the referee statement is certainly one way of being able to point people to potential reuses of that 
of that data. Um, and the other thing to mention is that, I mean, it seems like a very small point, really, but I also try to include the data citation correctly as if it was a bibliographic reference, because then that means that the ingest of the bibliography in the journal paper goes into Crossref, and therefore there is ways then of being able to track the cited by linking because you're actually properly citing properly. Again, it comes back to giving credit uh, to the authors for, for that work. Um, in relation to this, uh, the other thing that I've started to implement recently is our open badges. Um, they're nothing terribly groundbreaking or <laughs> um, earth shattering, but um, they're an external marker of that open practice. And really, all they're there to do is to, uh, uh, to signpost and to show where that further data is available. And it flags up, I suppose, our support uh, for authors who wish to make their data more available to do so. So it's open badges are, have been created by the Open Science Foundation. And basically, if you see a little tiny little open data, in this case, open data badge, by the article title. It just means that there is additional data that's there uh, that, that you can explore. Um, so that is another, another uh, uh, way of, of, of flagging up the underlying data within, within journal publications. So just to recap, the journal has a, a broad range <coughs> of content uh, and data. Um, certainly, a big important part of my role is not just look, keeping an eye on what's already been published, um, looking after what's been published already, maintaining and making sure that what people are submitting now is future-proof as much as we can, but then there's also that, that one eye on the future. I need three eyes, actually, don't I have, have an eye on the past, present and future? But, um, <coughs> also need to look at the future and looking at technologies and things coming down the line and and trying to know or anticipate what, you know, what we actually might need from authors in order to um, curate and to uh, maintain, um, maintain that, that data. So I've said that the journal's already been responsive in terms of data types, but we're also responsive to changes in the wider publishing landscape. Uh, the most obvious example of that being the journal switch back to open access about three years ago when it just seemed that that was the way things were going and it meant that we didn't have we could, well, I suppose we, there were lots of things that, that, that we needed to change in order to do that, but it, it was a fairly rapid process, but it meant that we could be quite responsive to, the, to those changes quite quickly. So there's a lot of fairly amount of preservation challenges uh, uh, in terms of the content that we've got. And as I said, we've been adaptive to new technologies. There is that issue of needing metadata, uh, and the, my, as the editor, adding in and enhancing a lot of the metadata that authors do provide. But there's that, uh, that role of data publication. Um, so I just wanted to sort of come towards the end by thinking how, what, how that's actually affecting our relationship with ADS and the nature of the digital content. I think it's been really positive. It's our, our, our continued close association means that we can manage those complex data resources uh, a bit more efficiently. But we can also share knowledge and share developments. I mean, we are literally in the same building. We're on the same server. There's a lot of internal efficiencies like, um, uh, like our, our author licenses, for example, but also the fact that I am also able to initiate tracking records and collection records uh, within the ADS system of content that has been published. And I think there's certainly a, a value to us in terms of time saved, but it, in the long run, it will hopefully uh, means that it's reducing the cost of performing research uh, at the end, because of course the journal content is also exposed uh, within within ADS. One lesson that I have come to learn is that it's important to build the publication around the data. Um, so, so certainly when we're looking at integrating resources, that it's been better that the data has been sorted out, if you like, first, that it's been um, you know, if there is a digital archive, that the digital archive is there because it makes building the publication around that so much easily, so much more easily. Um, another lesson that I've learned is that having those funding conversations can't come early enough, um, and I'm sure that's that's something that uh, we can all sort of uh, appreciate. But really, the biggest hurdle that I find is that it's not really in the technology; uh, it's 
it's still about people and it's about people's practices and about that culture change that is still, we thought that was in our original business, um, uh, ELIB project bid in 1995 that you know, culture change is important and it will happen in about three or four years and I'm here 20 years later and it's still not, it's still not happening. It's not that it's got better, but it's still not, it's still not that we've cracked it. So the data publication is embedded in the journal's practice. And uh, I mean, there are some obstacles. And I think just increasing the awareness that data deposition can enhance that visibility and that reproducibility of published research and increase those citations. Um, but there are limited resources, really, to, and that will limit our possibilities, perhaps, to share our data. But I think generally our research output is made more accessible by this approach. But however, the only the, the one distinction that I would make, and it's a point really that I want to, to end on, is that these approaches are great and they have a huge amount of value. Um, but that I think there is a uh, I think the publication of data is something that the ad, the publication of data is something that is that is added or is enhanced by full publication within the journal. Um, what I mean by that is that the journal is adding value and it's making the best use of the capabilities of the web. Um, yes, the data has to be curated, um, but the expectation of reuse of data, it's not the same as publication of the data by the original data creator. And I suppose that's the distinction really between dissemination of data and putting data up out there for reuse and the publication of data that comes packaged with the story, if you like, up for, by the original creator about what that data actually means. Um, and so that preservation and publication don't necessarily have to be separate. Um, so I think, have I rushed on? Is that about the right time? Just if I could have a quick, whoops, quick plug about uh, our project. There should be something in everyone's pack, but just uh, we would really be interested in canvassing your thoughts and about the approaches that the Internet Archaeology and ADS uh, have, have been taking. And we're running a very small sort of like uh, survey called Publican, hence the picture, uh, where, where really we're just looking for your input and some thoughts and some of the topics really that we've been discussing. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Okay.